I'm holding in my hand probably the most famous equation in the world, E equals MC squared. Um, what does this equation have to do with materials characterization? Uh, we'll keep watching and we'll find out. All right, so we have our equation that we uh, just talked about, which is the most famous equation, um, E equals MC squared. And if you notice, I capitalized the M and um, it's, it's kind of a common misconception that this really just stands for mass. Um, this actually stands for um, relativistic mass difference. And if you look at the uh, derivation of E equals MC squared, um, you'll see why it's, it's um, really a relativistic mass difference, okay? And there's different derivations out there. I've seen a lot of wrong derivations on YouTube, actually. YouTube, pretty good source of information, but sometimes you gotta be careful. And uh, some people, I think they just kind of make up what what they're saying and posted and I, I try not to do that um, but there's relativistic mass difference and uh, I do this derivation um, you can see other people uh, kind of do the do the same derivation and a lot of times I say you you have a student floating in space and um, the student has a glowing personality So student, and then let me make the pin a little smaller. Sorry about that. Hopefully I spelled personality right. But I'm an engineer, so it's okay if I didn't, but I'm pretty sure I did. A uh, student with a glowing personality floating through space, and there is some energy um, that the student gives off when uh, the student glows. So it's uh, there's a negative E. And the student's actually floating through space. Um, and so the student has some kinetic energy. So floating So students floating with a velocity e, glowing personality, gives off some energy. So total energy is um, negative e plus, excuse me, plus kinetic energy. And I want to be consistent with my dots. So this is kind of case one. And so say you're, you see this student floating in space and you um, go up into space with a rocket ship or a spaceship, and I, I usually draw my rendition of the Starship Enterprise. And let's see if I've done it well. This is old school Enterprise, like from the 60s, okay? Starship Enterprise, so you go up and see the student floating around, but your Starship Enterprise is actually moving and kind of, um, let's kind of talk about, we'll take a little segue. Um, you have blue shift and red shift. And then blue shift. 
So red shift, blue shift. So if you're in space, or if you're, yeah, we'll just say in space, and you see a star, and the star is floating away from you, okay, and um, this is a star. Sorry if it's not the best, but if the star is floating away, the wavelength is going to get longer. And it's going to be redshift. So away, redshift. So that's how um, astronomers and whatever um, kind of know if um, a star is coming towards you or moving away from you. If you see blue shift, on the other hand, and the star is coming towards you, It's going to be blue, and that's because the wavelength becomes shorter. Okay, so lambda is long, and here lambda is short. So lambda is long, lambda is short. That's the difference between blue shift and red shift. Um, what that means is we see kind of this Doppler effect. All right, and so now since we're in a moving vessel and stuff's moving around relative to us, um, we have this energy loss uh, multiplied by something else. So now the energy lost by the moving, by the glowing student, if you will, is uh, one plus V squared, so the velocity squared over 2c squared. All right, so now we have kind of two different situations um, where we have the Doppler effect, and it's kind of like if you, if you think about the ambulance, you know, it's Doppler effect, right? Um, you have a situation where you have uh, a movement kind of causing the difference uh, between how we perceive the loss of energy of the student. Um, the student's moving the same velocity every time, but the energies have to be equal to one another. And so we can write our scenario as a negative E, which is the energy loss, um, plus kinetic energy. And we have to kind of differentiate um, our scenario for uh, kinetic energy. So in this case, I'll just denote this one as two um, equals um, kinetic energy one minus um, the Doppler effect energy. Over two C squared. We can do a little bit of algebra, if you will. And um, we can move stuff around and say E times V squared over 2C squared um, plus KE2 equals K E one. Um, the way that was achieved uh, was by distributing this E here. And um, so we have negative E plus E times V squared over two C squared. Um, when we have to, we add e to both sides, so this e cancels, and then this guy goes over, um, and then hopefully you see that. You know what? Let me um, let me write it out um, just so you can see it. So I don't want to get sloppy. Minus e. Uh, so minus 
e again e times v squared over 2c squared. Hopefully you see that. You do a little bit of algebra. Um, these e's uh, these e's are going to cancel and then you move this one over to the other side so then we get this equation. And so there's some uh, kind of interesting stuff um, that we need to we need to kind of notice, right? So the energies have to be equal. Um, this velocity is constant because we say the student never moves. The um, c squared is a constant, so speed of light is c, celeritas. Um, so we know that we have to have some change now in the kinetic energy. So we have a one-half V squared, one-half V squared. Um, so we can factor uh, this stuff out. It actually, it actually just cancels. And since the velocity, so all this stuff's going to cancel because it's all the same velocity, um, the mass has to be different. So this is relativistic mass it's a relative actually this is relativistic my apologies relative gosh I can't spell today or any day relativistic mass difference, okay? All right, so we can say, I kind of had a mistake, I fixed it, um, and I kind of wrote it and I messed it up, but I'll edit it out. And then, uh, so what we can have here is we can factor out this V squared over two, and then multiply that by E over C squared, plus m2 and then we can rearrange this one and say v squared over 2 times m1 so if you didn't see that these cancel out before hopefully you see that they cancel out now and so now we have a, a mass difference right so we're saying that m2 m1 is actually relativistic mass difference so um, we can say e over c squared equals m1 minus m2. Um, if we really do some rearranging and I'll dun, 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 make the pen bigger, we get E equals and m1 minus m2 is equal to, do we just say big M? Okay, that's why if you notice, I put a big M at the very beginning. So E equals M, it's supposed to be a big M, c squared so e equals mc squared uh, for all intents and purposes let me uh, make it a bigger m because i kind of messed up my punchline. e equals mc squared which is oopsie i'm so sorry uh, what we just started off with and i kind of pointed out it's a big m we have our little derivation for e equals um, mc squared and um see my zoom m is actually relativistic mass difference okay and uh, kind of said that at the beginning of the video. For all intents and purposes, though, uh, people tend to write E. I don't like the way that pen looks. I'm sorry. I'll do a little better. E equals mc squared with the little m meaning mass. So we have the um, energy mass equivalency uh, given to us by Einstein. Um, C is the speed of light. Uh, C is celeritas. If you've had me in other classes, you know this. So C equals celeritas. It's Latin for speedy. Come on. Latin for speedy. 
or swift. Celeritas. So when we talked about X-ray diffractometry, we had another equation and talking about energy. And we had uh, E equals H, I believe it's new, or E equals HC over lambda, okay? So if we look at these two equations now, we have two equations that um, express energy in the form of something. So if you set these two equations equal to one another now, oh, HC over lambda equals MC squared, okay? And um, we're gonna do a segue into electron microscopy here, but let's, uh, let's do a little bit of math and um, we, can, we can solve for lambda. So we're gonna solve for lambda and we can rewrite this equation as lambda equals hc over mc squared and uh, this is Planck's constant very important constant if you think about it because we also see this uh, when we talk about the photoelectric effect as well Planck's constant um, we also see it when we want to solve for energies of x-rays and that kind of thing it's an extremely important constant in a lot of the stuff we talk about. Um, so this C is going to cancel. This C is going to cancel. So we have lambda equals H over MC. Um, C is a velocity. And we're talking about um, electrons. And electrons have mass. And, um, and sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, the mass of the electron is a 9.1 times 10 to negative 31 uh, kilograms. So we know that if something has mass, it can't go the speed of light. So, so things with mass cannot go the speed of light. So we basically substitute uh, V for C. So we can rewrite this equation. Lambda equals um, M, oh, excuse me. How silly of me. H over M V, classical Newtonian physics. Um, H over P, which is momentum. And this is uh, the de Broglie wavelength. And uh, you've seen it probably in other classes and, and I could have shared that same lecture from another class in this one, but I made you a whole new one. Um, de Broglie wavelength, and uh, this is a wave particle duality. Of the electron. And uh, it ends up being the basis. for uh, electron microscopy. All right, so 
until now, um, people had been doing microscopy with light. We know light has wave properties. People figured out later that light also has particle properties. Um, I talk about this uh, when I used to teach electronic materials, uh, you know, people's uh, um, fascination with who was right in terms of uh, light being a particle or light being a wave. And um, anyway, so the Broglie wavelength, um, very important. It's the basis for electron microscopy. And so electrons also have a mass and uh, the kinetic energy, oops, um, kinetic energy of the electron Um, you can actually express it in, in a classic Newtonian uh, um, equation. And so it's the Me V squared. And um, here, kinetic energy equals uh, to what? Here, kinetic energy... Um, usually kinetic energy is joules, that would be a, a unit, but here kinetic energy is the EV, the electron volt. And um, so here EV equals, and don't get the two Vs confused. Kind of shouted, didn't mean to. Velocity squared, okay? Um, EV, one half um, MEV squared, okay? A uh, voltage, it would be like accelerating voltage. Is V. This is velocity, okay? So I, I should be a little careful in my writing. We'll see these equations with better uh, script. Um, this is, of course, velocity. And uh, E is the elementary charge. Scratch that, I'm so sorry. Solve for velocity. And um, <clears throat> a little bit of little bit of algebra, not too too bad. Uh, we find that velocity, so this is little v equals um, the square root of uh, two E V over mass of the electron. Um, if we go back and uh, plug that into our basis of electron microscopy, the de Broglie wavelength. Um, let me see, lambda equals H over, and we'll say the mass of the electron V, which is velocity and plug that in, um, we, the, the trick is, is understanding uh, what to do with the M and it's not that big a deal. Uh, lambda equals um, H over, because we're solving for V or we're plugging in V, excuse me, over uh, the square root of two M E mass of the electron times um, E V. So mass of the electron times the elementary charge times your accelerating voltage. Um, this is just two and then Planck's constant. And uh, this is SEM wavelength.
So you can figure out the uh, um, wavelength of your electrons in your scanning electron microscope with this equation and by knowing your accelerating voltage. And uh, that's a, kind of a powerful tool, if you will. Um, you can compare this wavelength to uh, um, um, light, and you can see that you can get a much higher resolution uh, with an SEM if you plug it into uh, our Rayleigh criteria, criterion, and um, we'll, we'll see some more of that um, as uh, these lectures progress. Um, this, hopefully, I, I've kind of, I'm kind of talking slow and monotone, I apologize, but we, we started the lecture um, with this question now, how does, uh, how does E equals MC squared relate to characterization? Well, you use E equals MC squared along with Planck's law to get de Broglie's wavelength, um, which is a very important event, I guess, in quantum physics because it talked about uh, wave-particle duality. And uh, you can then use this de Broglie relation in a practical sense, which is uh, with an accelerated electron in a vacuum, basically, um, in a microscope, and you can get the SEM wavelength. So it all kind of comes together in this kind of really nice, elegant symphony. Um, hopefully I did it some justice all right, we're still talking about scanning electron microscopy. I have my handy dandy scanning electron micrograph I took myself back in 2010. It seems like a lifetime ago. Um, some things I wanted to point out, um, dimensional reference is on this. And uh, so the micron marker goes from here to here. So from this bar to this bar on Hitachi instruments, a uh, pretty common manufacturer of uh, electron microscope. Another common manufacturer is uh, Joel. So Japan Electron Optics Lab, uh, which are actually the first uh, people to come out with a commercially available uh, scanning electron microscope. Um, the way it's, it's kind of described is Joel is kind of like a Chevy, uh, Hitachi, uh, maybe, I don't know, slightly higher brand, uh, like BMW. Uh, but then you have uh, FEI, uh, which used to be Philips, and FEI is like the Bugatti, if you will, um, of, uh, of electron microscopes. So the finest uh, instrumentation um, is pretty much Bugatti. I'm sorry, FEI, um, Hitachi is a, uh, also a very good, they, d they do a really good job developing their own detectors and, uh, and stuff like that. And then kind of the old pickup truck is uh, the Joel, so Japan Electron Optics Lab. Um, anyway, so some interesting uh, items you want to uh, kind of notice when you look at a micrograph, it gives you some information uh, the magnification only applies to the original print mag, so that's why I always say the micron marker is by far the most important uh, piece of information you get. Um, it allows you to uh, turn kind of qualitative uh, information into quantitative information. Um, this is also important, so when I talked about accelerating voltage leading directly to the SEM wavelength, um, the accelerating voltage is just generally listed on the micrograph. You can, as a user on most machines, go and turn it off, uh, but it's good to kind of keep that in mind. So 20 kilovolts uh, was the accelerating voltage on this machine. This was actually a field emission microscope. Um, we'll talk about different uh, flavors of um, electron guns uh, later on. Um, and then working distance. So the distance between the objective aperture in your specimen is working distance and you typically want a shorter working distance uh, when you're doing higher mag imaging. Um, this isn't pushing this machine in any way. Um, if you look at the size of the micron marker, when you start seeing nanometers as your scale, you know you're starting to kind of push the limit of an electron microscope. Uh, but generally the micrograph um, output by the machine puts um, puts critical information on the micrograph for you.
Um, here's an example. Uh, it, SEM's uh, probably my favorite uh, characterization, characterization tool, excuse me, characterization tool. Um, here's an example of a paper um, written pretty much exclusively with SEM data and it got into a pretty decent journal, uh, Materials Letters. And I've shared this in other classes, uh, but this is looking at the microstructures of various conductive inks. And uh, we kind of see a grainy film uh, to uncensored particles, you know, all in the very small area. Uh, but the purpose of showing you this figure in this context is to show you that the SEM is a very powerful tool. As a researcher, you can write a paper exclusively on, uh, based on SEM imaging. Always talking about the uh, history of instrumentation, as I oftentimes uh, like to do. Uh, electron microscopy history, so this was all enabled by de Broglie and uh, kind of the understanding that there's a wave-like nature uh, to the electron. And in uh, 1924, uh, the de Broglie wavelength equation uh, was uh, come up with, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it again um, so you get something a little bit better than my handwritten uh, it, stuff, and hopefully that was helpful. Uh, Max Knoll and Ernst Ruschka um, basically made the electron research group that generated the first electron image, but it was actually done with a transmission electron microscope. And um, if you look, the TEM uh, in a lot of ways is actually simpler than a scanning electron microscope. And uh, the first commercially available TEM was 1935. Uh, the technology and scientific world uh, really shifted gears to uh, making weapons for World War II. And then we had the first commercially available SEM in 1965. And um, accelerating electrons through the columns is the basis, through a column is the basis of electron microscopy. And I'll show you some uh, examples of that um, in a later lecture. Uh, but the TEM came out first. SEM came out second and uh, all enabled by uh, de Broglie um, and the understanding of the wave nature of the electron. Um, kind of this is stuff I wrote by hand and uh, on uh, some of these previous, the previous part of this lecture, um, de, Broglie, de Broglie wavelength, uh, mass and velocity, it's the particle nature of the electron. And uh, you can look at, at page 185 in the textbook. Um, this is pretty much what I put uh, and derived it. So EV um, equals to one half MV squared. Um, e is the charge of the electron. V is the voltage. The little v is velocity of the electron. And M here is mass of the electron. I think I actually did a better job denoting things in the handwritten portion. Uh, we get the equation from some wavelength by equating the speed of the electron uh, with uh, de Broglie's wavelength and kind of plugging it in. And then we get lambda equals Planck's constant over the square root of 2 MeV. In this case, M is the mass of the electron. And um, um, you can figure out the wavelength of your um, SEM beam, the beam in your SEM, and you can kind of compare that with light. It's going to be um, a much uh, smaller wavelength, so therefore higher resolution. Um, Wave particle duality of the electron, it's, it's basically the heart of electron microscopy. And uh, kind of repeating this again, um, but anyway, in an electron microscope, uh, the electron is subjected to a potential drop. Um, I like just saying it's the accelerating voltage, uh, which we saw that listed on uh, our first micrograph here in uh, this section of the lecture. So rather than saying potential drop, just say, I just say accelerating voltage. And uh, so you can calculate two things. You can calculate the kinetic energy of your electron, actually three things, uh, the velocity of your electron, and uh, you can plug it in, you can figure out the wavelength of your electron. So three things, uh, just by knowing your accelerating voltage, because uh, that's really the only thing that's variable. And uh, so kind of have a different uh, denotion for momentum. Uh, but if you go back and look at the original uh, kind of handwork derivation, it, you, you get to the same endpoint. And uh, so lambda, you can, actually can use this approximation. Um, it equals the square root of 1.5 over voltage, and that gives you lambda in nanometers. Um, a lot of times I prefer just working it out. It's not that bad of, a, of an exercise anyway. But you get a lambda, uh, 
And uh, if you remember resolution from an optical system, um, let me get my laser pointer. Um, D, so the distance between two points um, is equal to 0 0.612 lambda over n sine alpha. Um, if you realize that n sine alpha equals numerical aperture, and now I tell you that in a SEM, uh, the numerical aperture is equal to one, uh, we see a direct proportionality between resolution and wavelength. And um, the SEM wavelength is smaller than an optical uh, wavelength, and I should have you work uh, something out that, that kind of shows you that. And uh, you'll see that the resolution of a SEM is, is higher uh, than an optical system. Um, SEM, scanning electron microscopy. Um, an electron beam scans a sample surface. Uh, the depth of field is eye-like, uh, which even at low magnifications kind of gives it some superiority over uh, the optical system. And uh, electron material interactions, so you can get electrons, photons, which really are x-rays as well. Um, it also gives rise to several opportunities to gather information. So you can get more than just imaging uh, with a scanning electron microscope. Um, I like this slide. I borrowed it um, from these individuals here um, because they, they really put it in terms of, um, of, uh, of us. And uh, so the most versatile instrument for material scientists, I'm, I'm thinking my face is cutting this part off. Uh, but it says the most versatile instrument for a material scientist. Um, so what can we study in SEM? I, I really like you really like this. It's, it's pretty easy um, to, um, or simple, uh, but it's powerful at the same time. So what can we study in, a, in an SEM? Uh, topography, morphology, chemistry, crystallography, depending on what kind of uh, apparati you have on your instrument, orientation of grains. Uh, you can perform in situ experiments. Um, you can do reactions with an atmosphere, so you can bleed stuff into your, bleed gases into your instrument. It's kind of cool. Um, effects of temperature. And all this is dependent upon what kind of toy, if you will, you put in your instrument. And uh, different investigators will have different so-called toys. Okay, I'm just calling them toys. Um, but different instrumentation that they put in their uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, the sample preparation is fairly easy. Sometimes you just have to coat with, with a conductor like gold or carbon. Um, my instrument, I have an instrument that you don't even have to coat. Um, you can put in relatively big samples. Uh, so when you consider that a transmission electron microscope, the specimen size is generally two to three millimeters in diameter and a few angstroms thick. Um, a SEM, you can, you can look at a relatively larger, larger specimens. Um, again, I borrowed these images from the same people. Um, I honestly don't know why, because I have plenty of my own images. I, 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 I question myself sometimes. Um, but depth of focus, so this is kind of important. Depth of focus, the, the surface of, this is probably the carbon tape they stuck their little crystals on at the bottom. Um, it's not obscured, it's not blurry. And I, I like this example of showing the power of uh, the depth of focus. So the magnification's pretty much the same. And, um, um, this is a screw, and so everything remains in focus on the SEM. And uh, so that's kind of showing um, direct comparison to an optical system, uh, some superiority of a SEM, even at relatively low magnifications, uh, compared to what you can get with a SEM. Um, what can you see? So I'm talking about magnification. Uh, so this is kind of cool. I, I always like these comparators, and it's kind of been a recurring theme. Uh, starting from the beginning of class where I, I gave you a, a or you were supposed to kind of go find an object in your house and uh, hold it and look at it and figure out, you know, what you can learn for, uh, about how that material is made, what it's made out of, uh, just by looking at it and touching it. Um, so you're limited with just your naked eye. Uh, with an optical microscope, you can see um, even smaller features and with an electron microscope, even smaller still. Uh, down to the nanometer range. So this is pushing it a little bit. Um, this is a slide provided by Hitachi. And uh, so on the nanometer scale, sub nanometer, very difficult to see with a SEM, um, you know, but somebody has taken a picture of DNA apparently with a scanning electron microscope. So the two nanometer range. Um, electron material interactions. And so we saw this with X-ray diffractometry An electron beam hits a target um, you generate x-rays and uh, the, uh, what you're hitting actually kind of dictates the energy of the x-rays, if you will. And uh, so if you hit aluminum, that's a soft x-ray. If you hit uh, something a little harder, 
um, that's a hard x-ray or, or bigger in terms of z that's a that's a hard x-ray and uh, stuff we get we get oj electrons and we talked about this already in this course uh, secondary electrons x-rays and uh, in the context of a uh, scanning electron microscope this is how eds works um, we also get backscattered electrons and uh, visible photons so cathodoluminescence and uh, so this is all electron beam hitting a material we'll see this figure again uh, so we get different signals uh, the primary signals that we deal with on an electron microscope or a scanning electron microscope, if you will, are backscattered electrons, uh, secondary electrons, and x-rays. Uh, we don't generally deal with OJ electrons on an SCM um, without uh, some sort of specialized apparatus. Uh, backscattered electrons, uh, the Hitachi TM1000 tabletop SCM, that's all it sees because it only has a backscatter detector. Um, the S4800 in metallurgy sees backscattered and secondary, and the SU3500 also sees backscattered and secondary. Uh, all three of the microscopes that we have available to us in the department uh, have EDS detectors, so we also see x-rays. So the, the primary signals that we generally see, backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, and x-rays. Um, I have kind of this slide twice and a uh, little bit different, but we'll see it very quickly. And uh, so secondary electrons, classically it was used for surface topography and refractography and failure analysis. However, uh, most students that have taken failure analysis have used that tabletop microscope, which only sees backscatter. And uh, so it actually is, is good at seeing uh, surface topography as well. But you get a little bit more out of it because you can see um, elements. So you get elemental contrast uh, with backscatter electrons from a back ladder, um, backscatter electron signal. Um, it's also called atomic number contrast. And if you have different elements in your phases, you can also see phase contrast. But that's only if your phase is differentiated by um, chemistry. If you're looking at titanium and you see alpha beta, it's very hard to see it on a polished specimen. Although I have seen uh, alpha beta um, differentiation on an unpolished specimen just because of the way um, the phase forms on, on a, like an ASCAS structure, if you will. Um, characteristic x-rays. So again, I'm talking about the three main signals we generally look at. Secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, and characteristic x-rays. That's, that's pretty much EDS. Um, you can get localized compositional analysis or also x-ray mapping. And we'll talk about this a little bit more detail um, as these lectures progress. Um, looking at figure 5.3 in the Brandon and Kaplan book, uh, we see a difference in electron flavor yield. And uh, OJ electrons are actually high yield. Okay, and we've seen this figure before when we talked about OJ electron spectroscopy. Um, but secondary electrons by far the highest yield, but they're the lowest energy, but that's okay. We can still get a lot of signal because there are so many of them generated. Uh, backscatter electrons, actually less likely to happen and uh, their yield is lower. Okay, relatively lower but their energy is much higher. And if you need to understand why, and we probably do, it's uh, important to see how they're formed. And uh, we'll take a, we've taken a little bit of look at a secondary electron when we talked about the generation of X-rays. Uh, you have an electron knocked out of the orbit of the atom and that knocked out electron becomes a secondary electron. Um, here, the backscattered electron, the incoming electron goes around the nucleus and comes back out. And uh, kind of showing this again, I don't know why, and I kind of foreshadowed, I probably should have deleted it, but just kind of talking again, the three primary signals we generally use in scanning electron microscopy, secondary electron, backscattered electron, and characteristic X-ray. Typically different uses, although for backscatter, you can also get surface topography. But if you're interested in topography exclusively, you pretty much will use a secondary electron signal you won't get phase contrast generally with a secondary electron uh, signal. Um, secondary electrons, so they're emitted from very close to the specimen, again, allowing for topographical analysis of a spectrum, a specimen. Uh, the generation of these electrons is not dependent on atomic number and a Z or the Z number. And uh, kind of some imaging, so maybe these aren't the best. These are a little older from when I was a younger lad. Uh, but I'm getting, and I'm actually getting a little bit of, of backscatter. That's a longer story. 
Uh, but generally, we use it to see surface contrast. Um, when we see glowing edges on features, that's generally telling you that that is a secondary electron signal. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as these lectures progress. Uh, your depth of field that you get um, is wholly dependent on electron yield. Okay, so this is sticking out and we're uh, closer to the surface. So we're actually getting more electrons hitting the detector and they're not losing energy on their way to the detector. So this top part is brighter than the darker part. And uh, we, can, we can talk about this in a little bit more detail uh, later, but there are differences and the, and the contrast is primarily driven by topography and uh, the edging. Okay, so edge effect is another uh, thing that we associate with secondary electrons. Um, a secondary electron, an incoming electron comes in and knocks out, knocks an electron out of the shell. And so this is an inelastically scattered electron. And uh, so that's a secondary electron. Uh, backscattered electrons. So the intensity is dependent on the Z. So a higher Z, that means your image is going to be brighter. So if I have a specimen made of tungsten and aluminum, the part of the specimen that's tungsten is going to be much brighter than the part of the specimen that's aluminum. It's, it, I, I keep this in here because uh, when I was young, this was kind of the rule of thumb. You don't really use it for topographical analysis, but that's old statement. That's an old statement. So things have changed. And I put that in there, uh, hopefully to give you guys an appreciation of how the um, technology has changed. Uh, we typically don't use it at high magnification, though that's also an old statement. However, if you're doing phase uh, characterization, you generally don't do that at high mag. And it's a lower intensity than secondary electrons. And we saw why, uh, because the overall yield is lower. Okay, and it's also coming from, um, we kind of say it's coming from deeper in the surface, um, but that's another kind of another story as well. Um, BSE, AKA elemental contrast microscopy. I tried to do my best to draw this curve in PowerPoint, but your incoming electron goes around the nucleus of the atom and comes back out. You have an elastically scattered electron when you look at this diagram, hopefully you get the feel for why this is a lower yield uh, because the odds of this electron going through an atom and coming back out without hitting the electrons that are orbiting the nucleus are very, very low. Okay, so it's not a very common occurrence. And you can see that just by looking at that graph that compares the yield of secondary electrons to the yield of backscattered electrons. This is not as likely to happen, so you don't get that many of them. Kind of like why we get more K alpha than K gamma, okay? Um, anyway, the odds are of it happening are low, but they're actually quite energetic, and uh, it has to do with the Z, so you're going to gather kinetic energy from a bigger nucleus than a smaller nucleus, so tungsten gives you brighter than aluminum, that kind of thing. Um, Put this here as a reminder so you kind of see this orthogonal scatter every time you see a backscatter uh, detector in a sem it's always above the specimen so it's always orthogonal to the surface and there's some creative designs that uh, have been come up so generally you have a hole in the in the center of the detector to allow the electron beam to pass through and hit your specimen and then you gather the scattered um, electrons, the elastically scattered, backscattered electrons. Um, imaging, so this is purely phase contrast, and this was uh, some older work uh, done by Dr. Varma's group, uh, and he would combine these backscattered images with electron mapping, and you get a pretty powerful uh, characterization. And uh, so this is, again, showing phase contrast, and uh, so the uh, titanium, I guess, silicide uh, was a lower um, Z overall than uh, the niobium psilocyte. And uh, so that's why you get differences in, uh, in the brightness. So it's chemistry driven. Um, this is a good place to stop for now. And in the next lecture, we'll start talking about electron guns. Uh, hopefully the uh, time spent going through the derivations of the, um, of the equations that are important to SEM are useful and uh, help you understand where everything came from and kind of the importance of wave particle duality in uh, scanning electron microscopy. Um, thank you for your time. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me a note. Oh my.
It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.